Marisola, good morning. Before we get started with the announcements, I'd just like to read 2 Corinthians verses, or chapter 9, verse 8. I'm reading the ESV. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, so that you may abound in every good work. We've got quite a few announcements to make this morning, so I'm going to just get right to it. And if I forget anything, I'm hoping that Pastor Corney will come up here and just bring that forth. So there's quite a few dates to add to your calendars. So if you have your calendars handy, or you, the beauty of doing this online, you can pause at any time and write the information down that I'm saying here. So as I've said in the past, I tend to get nervous and then I speak fast. So again, we can pause and write this information down if you need to. But the dates to add to your calendars are the pastor couple nominations will continue till next Sunday, January 17th. And marriage prep course has started today, so January um, 9th. So when you're watching this, it'll be Sunday. But it opened up January 9th and will run till February 6th. So there's five uh, sessions to be done there. Uh, ladies, online Bible study will start Monday, so January 11th. And then new life and discipleship classes are being planned for a February 6th start. So the pastor couple nominations, we hope that you have been praying for the upcoming ministerial election and electing two new pastor couples to the ministerial team at SMC Elmer. This nomination form will close at the end of January 17th. So please enter your email address into the first box and in the second box, list all the names of whom you would like to nominate for pastor couples. Just for clarity purpose, please include the last name of your nominees and the wives of the nominees. Uh, just so you're aware, we do not need your name or your, your uh, information when you're doing these nominations. And also, please continue to pray during this process for God's leading and timing. Uh, marriage prep course will be online this year due to the lockdown. Um, sorry for the short notice. It was uh, posted on Facebook. We were trying to figure out how to offer it this year, but I'm quite excited to say that the course has been taught that has been taught here for years was made available to us online, and the videos used used to be set in the 80s and 90s, but have now been updated. So if you have taken the course before, uh, you may want to reconsider or consider taking it again. There is no cost. Um, so again, the course became available today, so Saturday, and they are online. Uh, videos will be re released on the website, one per session, and you can find it on the events section on the website. Uh, the title is the pre-marriage course, and again, one video will be released per week. And once the videos are up, they will stay up for the duration of the course. This is a five-week course. So at the end of the course, all five videos will be available for a week or so for review. Or should you not have been able to get them in during the release week, you can catch yourself up. There is a workbook that you will need to download. You will each need the booklet. And I would actually encourage you guys to print it off and do the work on paper. And if anyone is unable to download it or print it off and would like or need a copy, just let me know. You can contact me through the email link that's on the website. But you can also contact me at 519-983-5097. Uh, texting is probably best as I work and don't have available to the phone. But if you do call, just leave a message and I'll be sure to get back to you. And I would be more than happy to get one printed off for you and get it to you somehow. And also, I strongly encourage you guys to please take the time. There's uh, conversation sessions that they ask you to pause the video for 10, 15, some five minutes. So please take the time to do them appro appropriately. So grab your watch, your phone, set the timer for what it tells you to do, and do them. 
Uh, you should give yourself approximately two hours per session to complete this. And then after each video session, I would encourage you guys to just discuss amongst yourselves what you've learned about each other and what God is teaching you through this lesson. I believe the course can add great value to your journey as a couple. So again, that's the marriage pre or the pre-marriage course. Uh, the next is the ladies' Bible study. The course is to live is Christ, the life and ministry of Paul. This will be up and ready for start on Monday. Anyone planning to watch will need to contact Susie Wall for the password to access the videos. Videos, uh, Susie's contact info is on the website, but you can also contact her at 519-859-2916. Videos will be going on the website one per week, but once they are up, they will also stay up for the duration of the study. So for those ladies whose books won't be in on time, and these books, if you're not aware, you can get through Amazon. Uh, they take about a week to get in. You can begin whenever your books come in and you won't miss any videos. As always, if anyone has any questions, feel free to contact Susie Wall. Our prayer request, uh, Ben Peters, he's one of our sound technicians. He's asking for prayer for his mother, Nettie Peters. She is in the hospital on the ventilator with COVID. Ben himself was also positive, but is starting to feel a bit better. And he is saying that if the more people that pray, the better. So feel free to share this request. Pray also for the ministerial and the pastor nominations, and also for all the other ministry leaders in this church. So you've got Sunday school youth, ladies ministries, men's prayer night, discipleship, new life class, marriage prep, small groups, missions, if there's any that I missed, I do apologize, but there's all these programs that have all been affected due to COVID. So just keep these uh, leaders and their programs in your prayers. As always, the government can use our prayers in leading the best way that they can. Seeing the events unfold in the states of what happened there, we can see that we need, we need to seek to God for help on these uncertain times. And the congregation, let's not forget each other. Let's continue to lift each other up in prayer and just continue to cling on to the only hope that is, that is sure, and that is Christ. With that, today in this reading, I will be doing out of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. With that thought, let's bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. As I came in this morning, I see the sunshine, it's shining, it's a little cold, but what a magnificent morning just to be able to, to see your wonders anew. So many things that everyone is so tired of hearing and talking about is the changes that are so constant. I'm just always reminded of the one constant that does not change, and that is your love and your promises. Father, remind us of these when we become weary. As Paul stated in the letters to the Corinthians that he had a thorn in his flesh, but he knew that your grace was sufficient. Teach us in these times that your grace is sufficient, and it is so vast. Corny started the prayer this morning with, thank you for so much grace, and we thank you for that. Father, remind us that without you, we are nothing. And remind us that our identity lies solely in who you say we are, not in the things that we do or in the things that we can't do. Father, you are enough. 
You are more than enough. Father, this morning, I just want to take this opportunity to pray for the nominations that are coming in. Father, may you just, may your spirit just guide, guide the, the doing and the selecting of, of whom you have chosen. And Father, I pray for the men that you have chosen, that you prepare their hearts, and, and not just theirs, but the family. May you, may you be especially near to them in this time. Father, I also just want to pray for all these ministries that are still going on, though different than before, like this marriage prep and the ladies' Bible study. May you, your spirit, again, just move in ways that, that only you can. We have a desire to get together and do these things in person. And Father, we pray that even though we're not able to do that this year, that your spirit will still move in the fruits that you may gather the fruits. Father, we thank you for, for Pastor Corny. We thank you for Steve that is always willing to come out here to, to help in these recordings. We pray for Ben Peters and his mother. May you be with them in this sickness. May you give, give healing where you see fit. And Father, and help us to just lift each other up in prayer, whether it is in quiet times or whether we pick up the phone and just give each other a reminders of, of who you are and who you say we are. Again, we thank you for who you are, and we just pray that this morning's message that Corny has, that you have laid on his heart, that as he brings it before us, that you, again, speak to us in ways that only you can. May you give him peace, courage to speak the things that you have for us through him this morning. We give you thanks for everything. In your son Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, good morning and welcome. We uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, this morning or whatever time you're watching this. Uh, may the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you as you watch this. And I, and I really do hope that this morning that you are nourished by his word. Uh, with the announcements that uh, Corny shared this morning, I, I do hope that you pray for those as well, that you consider uh, not just the leaders who are leading those and have to, do remo have to do so remotely, but also those who are in attendance of those um, programs, whether it's on their living room couch or wherever, but that when they endeavor to watch the videos and participate in the workbooks, that they do so with sincerity and that they truly are looking to um, be fed by the Holy Spirit through these things so that they can learn to trust in God as, as God had intended for us to, so that their marriages are shaped by God's love, uh, that we can learn to live selflessly and live for each other. And so, and with the Bible studies as well, that we always grow closer to knowing God more and being transformed by who He is. Um, and one more announcement uh, in regards to uh, a prayer request. Uh, if you guys could keep my mom in your prayers, uh, her sister has suffered greatly through the procedures of, of COVID. And so it's been very difficult for my mom to have to hear of how difficult it's been for her sister. Um, she lost a brother to COVID a few months back. And so it's just, it's a, it's a scary thought. So pray for peace uh, for that, that assuring hope that we have in Christ, um, and, and pray for healing, that, that God would do his, his wonders. And, and not, not, not necessarily that he would remove COVID, um, but that he would heal our anxieties, that he would heal the hurts and the pains, the places where we don't trust in him, that we would be completely healed in those areas. And if he were to remove COVID, praise him all the more. So pray for healing. Pray for trust, pray for faith, for understanding, all these things that come from God. And he is gracious and willing to give as soon as we ask. Before we dive in, uh, let's just open a quick word of prayer and we'll just get right into the scripture today. Father, we come to you this morning and uh, we think about all the people that we know um, that we haven't seen for a while. And... And we hear of some who are suffering. We think of uh, Ben Peters' mom, uh, even Ben Peters himself having gone through this, 
um, a little bit. And we think about uh, my mom and her sister and, and all of my, my cousins who are affected by this. And there are so many others, so many people we don't even know about. For some of us, we're not as, as impacted as others. And for those who are greatly impacted by it, 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 is a, it is a heavy, heavy thing to carry. And so, Father, we pray for your peace and understanding through whatever difficulties we are experiencing because of this virus. We pray for healing. And we, and we pray for that because we believe that you can do it. We believe that you are all-powerful. But at the same time, Father, we submit ourselves to your will, knowing that if we do lose loved ones because of the virus, we still trust in your will. We still trust that you are at work, and we still trust that you are still loving and you are still gracious, and that you see the full picture. So, Father, whatever it is that we are prompted to pray for, I pray that we do, with, do that with sincerity, and that we are honest and we are bold in our prayer before you, that we, we bring our requests before you. So, Father, bring us closer to yourself so that we can have faith in you, knowing that whatever it is that you do, it is righteous, that it is proper, it is good even when we can't see it. And Father, as we dive into your word this morning, would you give us eyes to see and ears to hear? It, it's, it's the stuff that we, we, we need from you. I pray that we have your understanding as we look into the scriptures in what may seem to be a very simple and plain text. Father, would you reveal your truth to us today so that we can get to know you more, so that you can be glorified, by transforming us into the image of your Son. We thank you for your Son and for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, I'm back into Mark after uh, taking a few, uh, I guess a, a month off of uh, Advent, Advent season stuff. And so we're back into Mark. We're in uh, chapter 6, verses 7 to 13. And, and I have to admit that Having read over this about a month ago and throughout the, the, the past weeks, I was struggling to find something super profound uh, to share with you, and, and, I, and I just I couldn't see it. And uh, so we'll read the text. I'll read a bit of Matthew's addition to the text, and then we'll just, we'll just walk through this. So Matthew 6, or sorry, Mark chapter 6, verses 7 to 13, and it simply reads as follows. And he, Jesus, called the twelve and began to send them out two by two. And he gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there and if any place will not receive you, and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. And then in Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 to 10, Matthew adds these details to the same story. And Matthew writes that these 12 Jesus sent out instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as, as you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without paying, give without pay. Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for the laborers deserve his food. So, as I said, I didn't find anything super profound or some, some kind of deep teaching in this text. And so I thought, well, we're going to read this text and call it a day. Um, but it turns out as I'm going through this that I don't have enough time in our regularly scheduled sermon that 
to even go through all of it today. So we're going to basically just be focusing on Christ's instruction to his disciples, and the rest we'll cover the next time. So taking a look at the scripture, this is not a parable. It's not a prophecy. It's not a poem where metaphors or hyperbole is used. This is a, just a matter-of-fact, uneventful transaction between Jesus and his disciples. The core of this text is literal. And so we need to take note that the aim of this text is actually not, for us, or not to us or anyone living today. Christ's specific instructions are for his 12 disciples. And in Matthew, he calls them by name. That's who these instructions are for. They're for his 12 disciples. And he sends them out in pairs. Now, we know, in, in, in our age today, we know that the gospel is for the whole world. But here we can see that this passage pertains only to the time and place in which it takes place. And only to the 12 disciples because they are sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So it's very specific to, a, to one demographic. Jesus specifically says, do not go to the Gentiles or any town of the Samaritans, but only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So in understanding the nature of the Bible, it's important for us to know that not everything written, that is written in it is written to us as something that we need to apply to our lives. There are many passages. The majority of the, of the Old Testament was not written to us Christians, but to God's chosen people as warnings and prophecies of things to come. Even though not everything in the Bible directly applies to us Christians that live in the New Covenant age, the entire Bible is for us in that it all points to Jesus who is our life. And so even in the passages that don't apply directly to us, we can still see the character of God revealed and learn from him and get to know him as we see how he works with his people. And I believe that is the case in today's passage. And so to narrow it down even further, Christ's instructions only apply to this particular event because there are other times where his disciples are instructed to take things with them, where they are, they are allowed to take things with them on their journey. And one example would be in Luke chapter 22, verses 35 to 37. And this, this takes place just after the Last Supper, and they're getting ready to go to the Mount of Olives, where Jesus says to his disciples, when I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? And they said nothing. And so Jesus says to them, but now... Let the one who has a money bag take it, and likewise a knapsack. And let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. For what is written about me has its fulfillment. So again, what Jesus says here is specifically for his disciples because of what they are walking into next. It's all this preparation for what comes ahead. And even though today's text appears to be mostly specific to that time and place, we still see the sovereignty of God played out through the person of Jesus. It still reveals who Jesus actually is. And that's where we get to have that insight and look at how Jesus reacts to the circumstances around him, how he, in everyday things... In instructing his disciples, even in those simple things, we see the sovereignty of God. We see the person of God in Jesus. He is fully God and fully man. And in this instance in Luke, Jesus foresaw his betrayal in the garden, which is why he instructed his disciples to take their stuff with them. Go and buy a sword, because there's a prophecy that needs to be fulfilled. In the case of today's main text in Mark, Jesus also foresaw his disciples would be taken care of on this, I would say, short mission of spreading the gospel. They would be taken care of and wouldn't need to take anything with them. Christ foresaw all of this. In the same way that Jesus 
was being completely dependent on the Father and doing what he, what he saw his Father doing, so the disciples are going to learn dependence on the words of Christ. It's like Jesus is their weatherman, except that Jesus is 100%, 100% accurate. He, he never faults with, with what he knows is coming because he's already at that place. He's already there. You know, before we leave the house, prob- we're probably all in the same habit. We check the weather app. You know, how cold, how warm is it outside? Do I need to bring an umbrella, an extra jacket, a scarf or gloves? We, 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 we try to prepare ourselves for what we have to endure for the day. And so we check for something to tell us what to expect for the day. And like Mike's message last week, the wind blows where it wishes. We hear its sound, but we don't know where it comes from or where it's going. But we know that it's windy. We know that there's something going on. So we must trust in the Spirit of God and follow His leading. How prepared do you need to be for what lies ahead? Do we actually know what lies ahead? We have the hope that this lockdown is over in a couple weeks. But I think that we're all in the back of our minds ready to accept that it may be extended. But we honestly don't know. So how prepared do we need to be for what lies ahead? Trust in God. And you will be prepared You will be as prepared as you need to be. It's the same with the prayer that Jesus prayed in in teaching his disciples how to pray. In that part where he says, give us this day our daily bread. Give us what we need for this day. We're not concerned about what we need for tomorrow or what we have neglected the day before. Give us today what we need. And that bread is Jesus himself. He is the bread of life that came down from heaven that shall sustain us. The sovereignty of God is in Christ as he sends at his disciples, preparing them to rely on nothing but the instruction of their master. The rest will come by God in due time through the hands of those who will receive the message that they were sent out to give. Christ is all they need because in Christ dwells the fullness of God who sees what lies ahead and who can prepare them for what they need for what lies ahead. Following Christ and being sent out by him requires trust in his word. And if we know God and believe that he is trustworthy, then it shouldn't be difficult. If we believe Jesus knows the outcome, then why are we so afraid to speak or go or do when prompted by the Holy Spirit? What are we trying to save if not our own reputation and our own life? Christ's disciples, they they went out upon his instructions with nothing but sandals on their feet and the clothes on their back and a staff And I think there's some significance there, which we won't have time to to get into today. But they took nothing extra for just in case. There, There really was no fallback. Aside from all of that, all they had was the message of Christ, which was repent and believe the good news and the reputation as students of Jesus. They carried his message and his reputation, denying themselves and their own methods You think about these guys. We covered uh, these 12 disciples months ago. And and even if you go through what we have in in the New Testament, they are some very different individuals with very different backgrounds. You can imagine if they were sent to preach the gospel with no instruction, how differently they would go about doing so. And so Christ gives the same instruction to all 12 of them. And keep in mind that Judas Iscariot is included as one of these. And so he's given the same instruction to all 12 of these these men who have different characteristics, different mindsets, different ways of seeing things and thinking things through. And these are the guys that Jesus sends out to spread the good news. And so 
they are now left to rely on nothing but the message of Christ and his instruction. There's no fallback. Their methods and their own skill will be of little to no use in this mission. mission. Up until now, they had sat at his feet and they heard from his doctrine. They had seen his miracles. And now Jesus determined to make some use of them. They had received that they might give. They had learned that they might teach. And up until now, Jesus was the only one spreading his message. And it was now time to put his followers into action in order to spread his message further and faster. So why send them out in pairs? Is there any significance to this? I'm going to list off about five portions of scripture here. The first one is in Deuteronomy Deuteronomy 17, verse 6. And it says, On the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses, the one who is to die shall be put to death. A person shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. Deuteronomy 19.15, A single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall a charge be established. In the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 13, verse 1, Paul writes that this is the third time that he is coming to them. And he says, every charge must be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Matthew 18, 15, verse 6, Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. And finally, John 8, 17, 18. uh, I believe Jesus says, In your law it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. So even though we see this trend through the Old Testament and the New Testament where on the basis of establishing what's happened in a crime, more than one witness is required. And in John, Jesus is even talking about this, about himself and the Father. And it seems like such a simple thing for Jesus to send his disciples out in pairs, but Jesus is simply following what has already been established with the Old Testament. But why is this important? Having more than one person proclaiming the same thing adds credibility to the claim. You know, don't take my word for it. You know, I have another witness, right? So more than one is better. Now, simply having a second person adding credibility to your claim, that statement by itself doesn't always work. Imagine if you have two people who both believe the same lie, and if they both preach the same lie, does it make that lie true? No, it's still a lie. Credibility comes in when what is said is proven by, proven to be true by evidence. And that's why that word evidence is used in these scriptures. Only by the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall the charge be established. So evidence is important. This is why Jesus gave his disciples the authority to heal the sick and drive out demons. Up until this point, only Jesus had the ability, and if these disciples were to do them as well, that would make for a solid case. And then if you have two of them who claim the same thing and prove that to be true by performing the same miracles that Christ did, it would seem to be undeniable that this is in fact the case. And what we have learned about the ministry of Christ up until this point through this whole opening section of Mark, it still applies here. And that being that the message of Christ, repent and believe the gospel, is of first importance. That is the front runner. His miracles are only there to back up and validate what he said. The words of Jesus and the truth that they carry are the important parts. And so they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. 
the message of Christ was spoken first by at least these two witnesses that were sent out in pairs by Jesus. They were eyewitnesses to his teachings. They were eyewitnesses to his miracles, verifying the truth of who Jesus really was. Secondly, the disciples performed the same miracles under the authority of Jesus himself, Christ living in and through them, spreading the good news. And I find that too often our focus is on the miracles, and I think we get caught in wanting to see a miracle for ourselves. That would be spectacular. That would be something to marvel at. But I believe we already have the greatest treasure, which is the good news of Christ. God has come in the flesh to meet us where we are and has offered himself up to pay the debt that we owe for all of our sin and to reconcile us back to our creator. You see, miracles are temporary. They're like a spark. It's exciting, and then it's over. It's gone. The good news of Christ, on the other hand, is forever. Looking at the events written down in this this time, in this place, I believe these miracles were necessary in establishing this brand new message that had never been heard before. How could they believe such an absurd thing as God coming among them in a person They they believed that a tabernacle was required, where the holies of holies was tucked away, where only the priest who was cleansed and prepared by, by rituals could enter that place, and that's it, no one else. To think that God would show up in the in a person and be among the people, that was an absurd idea. How do you establish this truth? How do you get to change how people have seen God for so long and he shows up in a completely unexpected way? Show them the power of God. Is the power of God the point? No, it's not the point. The power of God only points to the reality that God is actually among them. That's the part that Jesus wanted them to see. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It is intimately close. It is here among you. That's the treasure. That's the the miracle, if you want to call it a miracle. This raising the dead and casting out demons was secondary to the reality that God has come among his people. Paul writes that the gospel... The gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Jesus anointed his disciples with the same calling he has given in proclaiming the gospel to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The disciples were going to be the representatives of Christ, doing the very things that had blown their minds earlier. Right when Jesus is in the boat, And he says, peace be still, and the waves are still. Who is this Jesus? And as he's healing all of these diseases and casting out demons, who is this Jesus? And now Jesus instructs them and anoints them and gives them authority to do the same thing. Faith is going to be required. The Spirit of God is going to have to work through them. And the authority of their master is going to need to be present. I find it interesting, as I was backing up before this event in in Mark's account, and noticing that just prior to what Mark writes down here, Jesus was rejected. His message was rejected in his own town, where he had said, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. I find it interesting that that proceeds today's text. Could it be that where respect is lost among the people, that someone else should come in in order for the same message to be heard? I think that happens to a lot of us. We we attend 
church on Sunday mornings, and we hear from the same pastors every Sunday, and then we go to a conference or some kind of Christian event, and we hear of all of these different speakers, and, and they, they share the same message, but for some reason, when they say it, it resonates with us. And so I have to wonder if when we hear from the same people over and over and over again, do we lose that sense of, of respect and honor? And this thought crosses my mind often when I think about those closest to me who don't believe. Am I too close to have any effect on them? Do they see me too often that I become unappealing when presenting what I think is the greatest news on the planet? Do they need someone that they don't know as well or someone that they truly admire in their lives to tell them the same thing so that they can actually hear it? And that's a bit of a rabbit trail, but whether or not Jesus is sending his disciples out because he was rejected, the reality is is that Jesus is not afraid to entrust his message to be preached by someone other than himself. He is not anxious about how it will play out because he is sovereign. He knows how it's going to play out. This was the, the disciples' first time out preaching the message, doing the healings. And Jesus sent them out. He gave that to the Father. I think for me, that would be a difficult thing to do. They wouldn't do it right. They would mess it up. But Jesus gives them his authority. And he is is confident in who he is, because he is God. I'll close with this. For those of us who believe, when we preach Christ, expect God to bring about those opportunities in his own unique way. Do not assume that those opportunities will come in the same way, in the same fashion every time. There's no formula to this. People and their circumstances are different. But the heart of the gospel should always remain the same. We need not add anything to his message. Our wealth, our health, our success, our skill, they add nothing in making the gospel better. The call for repentance of fleshly ways to believing Christ is the power of God for salvation to all those who choose to believe it. Jesus is and always must be the heart of the gospel. For those of you who are watching or listening and do not believe the good news of Jesus, I gain no earthly prize in extending Christ's invitation to you. The life that you live independently of God, no matter how good you think it is, or how bad it has become, or how unique you think that it is, it is still a life of sin, and it cannot be anything more than that, because it's independent of God. And so, the invitation is turn to God, because He is merciful And he has already accomplished your complete forgiveness on the cross through his son, Jesus. It is a done deal. It is taken care of. This is the depth of his love for you. And his invitation still stands. Salvation is his free gift to you. And the moment that you believe, you are made righteous and whole no matter what mess you find yourself in right now. Now, I'm not calling you to come follow me. I'm calling you to believe Christ and follow him. And again, you don't have to take my word for it. Get yourself a Bible. Read it for yourself. Seek him with all of your heart and you will find him. 
That is his promise to anyone who seeks him. Never think that God doesn't have time for you or that he is not big enough to cover what you have done. I urge you to trust in him, to have faith in him, to believe him because he is trustworthy and faithful. We'll take a moment of quiet prayer. And if you're willing, uh, kneel where you are. And uh, I'll close in prayer and then the benediction. So if you're willing and able, take a moment on your knees and uh, we'll close in prayer. Father, we thank you again for this time and for your promises that you, are, that you are with us. I pray, Father, that we have been nourished and fed by your word and that only your truth has been heard and understood. Would you continue to transform us into the image of your Son? Would you give us the strength to lay aside our fleshly ways? and to walk in the good works that you have laid up before us? Would you give us the desire, the strength, the energy, the ability to walk in your goodness? To live holy and righteous lives because you are holy and righteous in us. I want to thank you again for your word, that we have it, we can read it, we can study it, I pray that your Holy Spirit would lead and guide us into all truth as you promised he would. And that we would willingly receive your understanding. That we would pray for it and understand that you graciously give it. We thank you for the work that you're doing during this lockdown. I pray for those who are who are suffering the isolation. For those who have a strong desire to be around people. For those who are encouraged by their presence. We pray for your strength to endure whatever it is that lies ahead of us. I pray that we are honorable, that we are, that we are found faithful to you. And Father, we thank you for the Holy Spirit. We don't know how to pray. I I feel at a loss for words. So Father, thank you for knowing us deeply, knowing our hearts, knowing our minds. May we just lay them before you and expose ourselves before you. See where there is unrighteousness in us. We thank you for the work that you're doing. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And I'll leave you with a benediction from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 to 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. And go in the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ.